On November 21st, 2022, the company Quera made their quantum computer, which they called Aquila, accessible to the public. Part of its functionality was picking up and moving around individual atoms, which you could use to create any pattern imaginable, as long as it satisfied this big list of restrictions. On October 26, 2009, a shadow art music video for the Toho song Bad Apple was uploaded to the Japanese language video sharing site Niko Niko. It quickly became a meme that people played on everything from fluid simulations to Windows Task Manager to logic gates. The time had come. Some idiot could just tell Aquila to play Bad Apple on literal atoms. But wait a sec, how does moving around atoms help you compute stuff? All right, so you probably know how you know, a normal computer works. Right, which is that it stores information in bits, where a bit is physically, right, it's just some system that can be in one of two states, which we represent as either a zero or a one. And in much the same vein, quantum computers use qubits, which are also quantum systems that we could observe being in one of two different states. So these might be like zero state is the electron is at a low energy level, and the one state is the electron is at a certain high energy level. But it's not enough to just represent it as a zero or a one, as we'll see. What we do instead is we represent it as a vector. And these vectors are sort of like black boxes, right? No one can tell me the components of the zero state vector. We treat them as basis vectors in a state space that we just make up, right? This isn't anything physical. These aren't actual things at 90 degrees. This is representation of the possible quantum states. And the way this works is that before we measure a qubit, it can be in any unit vector that's within this, sp this space. It has to be a unit vector. It has to have length one. But other than that, it can go anywhere on the circle as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And so anytime you see these, you know, cats, they represent some quantum state, right? The cat is just like the bar and the little angle bracket thingy. That represents, you know, some vector that's representing a quantum state. And then anytime you see a psi, that just means kind of like an arbitrary quantum state. It's just kind of the default letter we use for some reason. But in this particular example, where it's, you know, like at 45 degrees, it has equal components for both how much is it in the zero state and how much is it in the one state. But I mean, you can see it's kind of like acting like it's in both states at once. And this is Schrodinger's cat style superposition. There he is down there. But like, what's up with this, like how much we are in one state? Well, these are called amplitudes. And we write them like this. So B is like the basis vector or the basis state and psi is, you know, whatever vector, whatever state we're talking about. And so in this case, for example, the component of our 45 degree angle, you know, quantum state vector in the zero basis is the square root of one half. So we say that like the amplitude of the zero state in our, you know, 45 degree angle, whatever state, it's actually called the Hadamard state, but that doesn't matter, is that, that number. But amplitudes can be negative. And that means we can have stuff cancel out within a, a qubit. Right? And this is super important because if I have a, you know, a superposition of like every possible, like I'm trying to search for something, right? If I have a superposition of every possible place I could look, then I'm gonna end up with just a superposition of like, yes, I found it, and no, I didn't, right? What we need is an actual answer. So we have to you know, have some sort of interference between the different states within a single qubit or within a, you know, single system of qubits. But they can also be complex. It gets even crazier because what I've been drawing is a circle. Here is actually a sphere. It's called the block sphere because we can have complex amplitudes. They just have to satisfy the, the same rule, which is they have to be unit right? The length has to be one. So before being measured, our, you know, the vector representing our state can be any unit vector in this space. But once we measure it, obviously we can't measure, you know, Schrodinger's open the box and find out Schrodinger's calf is, is both like half alive and half dead. That, that's not how that works. So what happens is it collapses into one of the basis states. And this is where amplitudes come in handy because the probability that a certain quantum state will collapse into a certain basis state when we measure it is the absolute value of the amplitude squared. And this is called Born's rule. So if we have our, you know, Hadamard state just like before, and we want to find the probability that when we measure it, it will collapse into the zero state, we just need to take the amplitude, which we know is square root of two over two, and go follow Born's rule and tells us the probability is one half, which makes sense, right? Because this has equal amplitude for both the zero state and the one state. So it makes sense that it would be, you know, the probability of one half for it collapsing into either one. So the Aquila system, as its qubits, uses neutral rubidium atoms. And rubidium has a single valence electron in its outer shell, right? And electrons and atoms can exist in a couple of different energy levels. And the way this works is these are discretized, right? So it can exist at this level or that level, but it's not allowed to be anywhere in between. And the way this works is if we hit that outer electron with a photon, so light, of the exact right frequency, we can cause it to transition from one energy level to another, and it'll absorb the photon in the process. Then, if an electron is at a high energy level, it can just randomly decide to emit that energy as a photon and fall back to a lower energy level. Now, the way you're probably used to this working is that these energy levels correspond to different orbital shapes, right, just like from APChem, of where the electron could physically be in space. And this is most of the story, 
but it turns out that there are what are called hyperfine states, which are different energy levels, but the electron, the, like the orbital shapes are exactly the same. And these make for extraordinarily stable qubits, and they're one of the super cool aspects, or super promising at least aspects, of neutral atom quantum computing. You, cause you can, because these two states are so similar, right, you can have a superposition of both of them last for seconds. It's awesome. But we don't actually deal with that. What we do is we go to the exact other end of the spectrum and look at a very, very high energy state which is called the Rydberg state. You're not reading that wrong, it's literally 7ds. So what physically happens when an electron is in the Rydberg state is that its electron shell just becomes ginormous. And this is like the, the one state that we use, right? Zero state is the normal ground state. One state is this Rydberg state. So one of the things we need to be able to do for this though is to cool these atoms to like micro Kelvin temperatures. And how we do that isn't super important, but it's just so cool, I couldn't help myself. So if we have our atom that's in a low energy state, and we hit it with a photon of the correct frequency, it'll absorb its energy, but also its momentum, so it'll start moving. Then, when it emits that energy, it'll keep the momentum, because we're just emitting it in some random direction, right? So it'll, it's, we've made it start moving. Now, if we take an atom that's already moving, it'll go right by, because of the Doppler effect, right? That atom will see a photon of a slightly shifted frequency because it's moving. So, if we count over that, and use a detuned photon, then it'll absorb it well, and in this case it'll slow down, because it's going the opposite direction. But once it's slowed down, that detuned photon will go right by it. So all we need to do is just blast detuned photons at this atom, and we'll be able to gradually slow it down. This is called laser cooling, or sometimes Doppler cooling, and it's awesome. But you might be wondering, you know, where did the energy go, right? Because obviously you took energy away from the atom. To cool it. But if we do on time for a little bit, remember that we absorbed a detuned photon with slightly lower energy. But then when we release it, we're releasing a photon of the correct slightly higher energy. So let's say that our task is, you know, we have two qubits and we want to create a superposition where there's two options. Either the first qubit is one and the second qubit is zero, or the first qubit is zero and the second qubit is one. Right? So they're just opposites of each other. And the way we would do this on you know, a normal quantum computer is by applying a series of gates, which would just are just things we can do that affect the state of an individual qubit until we get the state we want. So the first thing we'll do is we'll apply what's called an X gate to our second qubit, and that's gonna rotate our vector. So now we've gone from the zero state to the one state. Then we'll apply what's called a Hadamard gate to our other qubit. And now it'll be in the state we were talking about before, where it's, you know, equal probability of going into each, equal amplitude for both the zero state and the one state. I wonder why we call it a Hadamard state. It comes from the Hadamard gate. But we got our superposition. So what we're gonna do now is we need to sort of connect these qubits, right? Because if one of them is zero, then the other one can't be zero too, that kind of thing. So we'll write them out as, you know, mathy vectors just like that. But we can also represent this whole system in a similar thing. Right, so the, we have a superposition of zero and one that's equal for the top qubit. The second qubit always has to be one, so we can treat the whole system as being in a superposition of the state zero, one, and one, one. So now we do something interesting. We say, apply an X gate to the second qubit if the first qubit was in the one state. Again, this isn't like we don't literally go check because that would involve observing it. We do some operation that has this effect. And so now we can look at it, you know, component um, by component. So for the zero one component, nothing's gonna happen to it, right? Because this is, we're only gonna do stuff if the first qubit is in the one state. And in this case, it's not. In this case, however, it is. And so we're gonna flip the second qubit. Right? It's gonna go from one state to zero state. All the X gate does is it just flips back and forth between one states and zero states. It's actually a rotation, so we got a negative phase, but don't tell anyone. All right, this is what entanglement is though. Right, this is, you know, Albert Einstein called it like spooky action at a distance, right? Because these qubits are now intrinsically connected in that they're both in this sort of combination state, but if I were to measure one of them, I would know the state of the other. And the other would, wouldn't be in a superposition if I were able to, you know, you were able to know that information's weird. The point is the two qubits are connected now, and now we have our quantum superposition that involves more than one qubit, right? So this is entanglement. So what, the way these, these kinds of quantum computers work, you know, the normal ones, is we encode our problem as a series of gates that we apply to our qubit, like H, you know, the X gate and the controlled X gate. That's what we call the ones with if statements attached to them. We do something different on Aquila. Aquila's weird. What we're gonna do is we'll the same same goal. We're trying to create the state where they're both opposites of each other. So we have our two atoms. We start with them both in the zero state. And we throw energy at the end in the form of photons. We, we, we send a bunch of photons. 
this is enough energy to boost it into the Rydberg state. So let's say, what happens if this one were to go into the Rydberg state? Right? Remember the Rydberg state we're using to represent one? Well, remember what physically happens when a, an atom is in the Rydberg state, or I guess I should say an electron is in the Rydberg state, right? Its electron shell gets huge because it's a super high energy state, and that actually, that big electron shell, means that other nearby or sufficiently close qubits need more energy to enter the Rydberg state. So the energy we've given them is no longer enough, and it just sort of, the photons pass right through. Of course, now we have one, you know, qubit affecting another qubit. This interaction is called the Rydberg blockade, right, because one qubit is blocking another qubit from entering the Rydberg state, and this is how we get entanglement in these kind of systems. Even, even more normal gate-based um, neutral atom systems, you oftentimes use the, the Rydberg mechanism for that. But of course, the same thing could have happened the other way, right? This one could have gotten the energy. There's nothing, no reason for one qubit to be preferred over the other. Both of these are perfectly valid. So we actually have a superposition of both of these cases. And there we go, we got our, we got our state. The interesting thing here, right, is now the only way to make one qubit different from another qubit is by changing which qubits it's physically close to, right? We're encoding our problem in the geometry of the system. We don't have gates the same way. The geometry of where the atoms are encodes the problem that we're asking itself. The little hiccup here, right, is that we can actually do more than that. It's a little bit more powerful. We should give some credit. Because we're not just, you know, throwing energy at them constantly all the time with no control over it. These are photons that we're blasting at them. And we could change the properties of these over time. So we could change the frequency, um, which is the part at the bottom, or the amplitude, you know, how powerful they are at the top. The thing at the bottom is actually detuning, which is like relative frequency, but it doesn't matter. So this equation right here tells us how these qubits, you know, will evolve over time. Uh, don't, don't worry about it too much. I know some of you probably ran away already because all the scary math, but we don't need to understand that, right? All that matters is that there's aspects of the global, you know, us blasting photons at the atoms that we can control, right? The amplitude of the phase and um, the frequency slash detuning. And then there's this term, which just explains the Rydberg blockade, right? This depends. This isn't the same for every, right? These are the same for every single atom in our system. This we, you know, can be different because it's based on the distances between different atoms. And so our problem is encoded in geometry, but also we can use those global parameters. Let's see how much this is going to cost, because it shouldn't be that much, because it's only like 30 cents or something per experiment. It'll do 10 FP. Yes. Damn it. Video. All right. So at this point, I was pretty tempted to just give up, but I had an idea. So what we actually have Aquila generate out of atoms looks like this. So the gray region represents like one particular frame. And once we, you know, for every real frame of the actual Bad Apple video, we go find the little region which has the contents of that frame and then just take that and put it in the right spot. And this saves so much. And it's actually pretty efficient too, because we can, if you know, if two frames only differ by one pixel, we can just use the same one. So it's, it's, it's great in that regard too. And then you know, this is this is what you'll end up seeing in the final output. So on the left side is the actual reconstruction, and then on the right side is what the Aquila system actually generated to get that. But this is only enough for this only saves us enough for a resolution of eight by four. If I want to only spend like thirty dollars maximum. So since this kind of sucks, I decided to compromise, and the first forty-five seconds are rendered in sixteen by eight resolution, which is this. Right, so it's a little bit better. <laughs> and then the rest is eight by four. So this is great and all, but now we have all these awkwardly shaped rectangles for each frame, and we have to somehow fit them all together into the square that we have. And this is, you know, a somewhat well-known problem. It's called 2D bin packing, because we're packing things into these bins. And I wrote my own library to, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I use someone else's library, thankfully, which, you know, can, can solve this and figure out the best response. Although, wait a minute. Heuristic means that it's not actually figuring out the best one. That's too hard. So it's just trying to get something that's decent. Um, yeah, it turns out that 2D bin packing is really, really difficult. In fact, we can actually prove that it's really difficult, but that requires going on a bit of a tangent. All right, so the way we deal with this is we imagine a magical theoretical you know, machine with infinite memory. So here's its infinite memory and it's controlled by basically a flowchart so we have some start state we say go here and you know do something and then go here and we can have conditions you know, that kind of thing these are you know this is like yes if yes do that if no do that and then eventually we end up 
in some sort of stop state when the program ends. Right, so this is just like a theoretical version of a computer. And this is a Turing machine, not a Turing machine. Letters are hard. All right, so let's say that we have an input of size n. All right, so input size we call n. And what we care about is the number of steps that this Turing machine can solve what requires. Uh, to solve our problem. So if we have an easy-ish problem, one that let's say involves like searching over all pairs of numbers, right? So you've got like zero, zero, all the way up to like five, five or whatever, right? In this case, n equals five. The number of steps that this would require is n squared. And so the way we do this is we define a class of problems called P. And P refers to anything, any problem, that this normal Turing machine can solve where the number of steps it takes is some polynomial of the input size. Okay, and that, you know, that, that makes sense. Because if we had something maybe, you know, crazier, like let's say we're searching through all the possible bit strings, right? So now we have like bit strings of a certain length, we have zero, 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 one, zero, zero, you know, all the way up to one, one. Now, if we're searching through all of these, right, in this case, we have n equals three, that's going to use an exponential number of steps. All right, so this is too hard, and this does not count, this you know, fancier problem does not count as p. But where things get interesting is when we make up a magical, even more magical version of a Turing machine called a non-deterministic Turing machine, which does things that, you know, if you were to like physically build something, obviously you couldn't have infinite memory, but we're going to go even farther and say that there's multiple no paths and maybe multiple yes paths too. And the way this works is it doesn't just like pick one randomly or anything. It follows all of these paths at the same time. So you know, you start here, you start, then you go here, and if it turns out to be yes, then it would follow all of these three paths simultaneously. And so this, you know, non-realistic crazy Turing machine would be able to solve our bit set problem um, or bit string problem, right? Because what we could do is, you know, set the first bit to one, then set the second bit to one, and then set the third bit to one. And at this point, we would just have the state one one. But then we could add alternative paths like this. And now we could create zero, 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 if we were to go like this, and we would end up with every, you know, it would be exploring every possible amount in between. And so problems that this non-deterministic Turing machine can solve in a polynomial polynomial number of steps. We call that class NB. And this includes a ton of problems, including lots of really hard problems. The one sort of really cool thing, though, is that we don't actually know if these two classes are equal to each other. It kind of seems unlikely, right? Because P has lots of easy problems, and P has lots of really hard problems, but maybe there's some you know, clever way where we can turn these hard problems that are NB into easy problems in B, and we just haven't found it yet. So we don't actually know whether these are different yet. Maybe someday we will. I think that was a little bit better. Up next, computer scientists claim to have solved an infamous problem known as P equals NP. Researchers around the globe have been bulk ordering chalk in order to verify this proposed proof, which has caused a massive spike in the price of chalk, and a single stick now costs more than $100. There's lots of chalk in the classroom you're not supposed to be in, so you and your friend decide to split it evenly. Um, but it's all different sizes, and so you have to figure out some way of putting it together where you end up both having the same amount of chalk. This problem is called the partition problem. And I would write the rest of this out on the chalkboard, but chalk is now worth thousands of dollars, so I'll just make some animations. So let's say that we have some problem, we'll call it A, and we can transform that into a different problem, which we'll call B in polynomial time, as in like the class P that we've been talking about. If this is the case, we say that A is polynomial time reducible, 
to be and write it like this. Although usually we'll just say reducible. And it turns out there are some problems which any problem in NP is reducible to them. And since this means they sort of act like the hardest problems in NP, we call them NP hard. A sort of classic example of an NP hard problem is the subset sum problem or SSP. And the way this works is we're given a set and a target sum. And our goal is to find a subset of numbers in the set that all add up to our target sum. It's pretty simple. So now let's try and show that the subset sum problem is reducible to the partition problem, like with the chalk. So we'll take our set and add this number to it. The important part is that this makes the total sum be equal to 2t. So t is, remember, the target value for our subset sum problem. Now, when we partition it, both partitions will have a sum of t, and we can ignore the one that has our extra number in it. And there we go, we're left with a subset of the original set that sums to t. So we've solved the subset sum partition problem. And since any problem in NP is reducible to the subset sum problem, and that's what makes it hard, the same is true for partition. So partition is NP hard also. So now let's try and reduce partition to the bin packing problem that we've been talking about. So what we'll do is we'll take our set, which is gonna be partitioned. And the way we'll do that is by assigning a rectangle to each number where the width is just the maximum width of the bin and the height is the number in the set. And so now, if the sum is s and the uh, total height of each bin is s over 2, then solving the bin packing problem will mean solving the partition problem. And there we go. The bin packing problem is NP hard.